Let me op have you open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, and I'm going to begin at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Jump down to verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. I'm going to stop right there. President Abraham Lincoln, March 30th, 1863, a proclamation. Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God in all the affairs of men and of nations, has by resolution requested the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers and wealth and power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace, and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. I'm not going to read any further. I wish we had politicians like that today. This is not a religious government. This was a secular government, but it was intended that the secular authorities would be guided by the scriptures. You got Muslims in U.S. Congress now. You got atheists in U.S. Congress now. You've had atheists wanting to run for president in years past. And you have Democrats. <laughs> God help us. But that national day of prayer and fasting eventually led to the first official 
day of thanksgiving to be observed the fourth Thursday of every November. Yet our nation is not thankful. What America needs, rather than a day of thanksgiving, is to go back to a day of fasting and prayer. Maybe even sackcloth and ashes. But we believers should be the most thankful people in the world for all that we have by God. And since Christ said, I and my Father are one, John 10, verse 30, the qualities and virtues of the Heavenly Father are also the qualities and virtues of the Lord Jesus. So let's examine some of those today in what I call what we have in Christ. What we have in Christ. First of all, we have a forgiver. Verse 3 says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. The New Testament we read, This is the covenant that I will make with them in those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10, verses 16 and 17. People may say they forgive you of something, but you still kind of wonder. They may forgive you, but it's almost impossible for a person to forget the way we're constituted. It's hard to forget something. And you're afraid they might look at you in a little bit different light. P.T. Barnum, the famous entertainer, once said, To forgive heals the wound. To forget heals the scar. If you can. But the Lord God forgives and forgets every sin in your past. Verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Thank God for that. Now, when God looks at you, he no longer sees you filthy because of your sin. He now sees you covered with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He suffered for your guilt so that you can share in his glory. Thank God for that. God is the forgiver of sins. Being able to forgive someone brings about at least five physical and medical benefits. Let me run through those. They're being able to forgive and having been forgiven are, are two very uh, powerful influences. If you forgive someone, um, Oh, I'm losing my place here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Forgive someone. Um, you have a lower blood pressure, a lower heart rate, which is beneficial. You have uh, less need for medications if you've been prescribed some. You have a better quality of sleep. You have less fatigue, the, the feeling of being just totally exhausted and worn out. And uh, your general physical complaints of this thing, that thing, and the other thing, uh, reduce. But those benefits are also are naturally transferred to the person who you forgive. They receive those health benefits also. A Gallup poll a few years ago found that 94% of Americans believe it's important to forgive someone who has wronged you. But only 48% said that they tried to do so. Remember how good it felt the day you got saved? The day you got up from your knees and off, opened your eyes and, and felt that God had forgiven you of your sin, like a weight had been lifted off your shoulders. You know, when you've hurt someone else and you're sorry about it and you've apologized, but that other person won't forgive you, it can eat away at you. It can weigh on you like a, a heavy burden. And you want to be forgiven. The Bible says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, Ephesians 4, verse 32. So if you receive the blessing of God forgiving you, then you as a Christian should be willing to forgive someone else who wrongs you, because you're no better than they are. You really aren't. 
You're maybe enjoying the grace and the, the forgiveness and the forgiving love and power of God a little more than they're enjoying it right now, or maybe they're not even saved. But that is to be Christ-like in forgiving them because Christ forgave you. Jesus said, freely ye have received, freely give. Matthew 10, verse 8. So in Jesus Christ, we have a forgiver. Secondly, not only do we have a forgiver, we have a healer. Verse 3, who healeth all thy diseases. The prescription for healing found in the New Testament is in James 5, verses 14 and 15. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. There's that word again. Now we freely concede that physical healing is ultimately up to God. James 4.15 says, For that ye ought to pray, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. No man in the world can twist God's arm and name it and claim it and expect God to do it the way he asked him to. All you can do is trust him. That's all anyone can do, is to trust that God is looking out for your best interests. Don't approach God thinking he's out to make my life terrible and ruin it. He's looking out for your best interests. And when people want to get away with their own uh, indulgence of the flesh, they want to do things that feel good to their body, or their, their flesh, and their, their quick, their momentary you know, thrill, they stop reading their Bible because there might be some text they come across that reminds them maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe that's not what you want to do as a believer, as a representative of Jesus Christ. But no man in the world can just name it and claim it and expect God to do it like these TV preachers um, teach. My mother alluded to this earlier. Let me make this personal for just a minute. You know I've been battling, and now everybody on the internet will know, but you know I've been battling cancer for the last four years of one kind or another. And uh, I appreciate your prayers. And I can't tell you how overwhelmed I was to learn of people who said they were praying for me in England, in Scotland, in Australia, and friends of my parents across the nation, and all of you and people up in Northern California, Brother Gene Huss, congregation, so, so forth. And uh, presently, my MRI, the brain tumors, the, the lymph nodes and the PET scans, the MRIs and the PET scans are currently showing no sign of cancer anywhere in my body. So I'm very thankful to God for that. So I have much to be thankful for this year. But keep praying for me anyway. I appreciate that. But there's a lot more to healing than just these physical bodies. Every Christian should know that much. When you have a broken heart, you want that to be mended. When you're lovesick, you've been hurt by somebody, you want the healing that comes from some consolation. When you're sick with grief and loss, you want the medicine of a kind word or some friend put their arm around you and tell you, listen, we're praying for you. We want to help. And above all, the disease of sin can only be treated with the, with the remedy of salvation Amen. by the blood of Jesus Christ. We believe that healing is in the atonement of Jesus Christ. We've prayed for people and they've got better. I prayed for myself and I'd get better. Dr. Ruckman used to say he prayed for his sick dogs and God would heal them. But the truth is, you don't get all the benefits of the atonement yet. You get your sins forgiven now, you'll get your new body later. The Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Amen. For we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, verse 2. The truth is, 
you can't force God to heal you when you want to be healed. You can't force God to perform a miracle when you ask him for one, when you demand one. The very idiotic, presumptuous idea that I'm going to demand something of God. <laughs> Think about that. That's comical. That is one of the most comical things in the world, that I'm going to demand something and I'm going to name it and claim it. God has to uh, shut up, you know? <laughs> really. Some of these goons on Christian television are, are just... They got... I was watching... It wasn't my doing. guy that I work with turned the TV on in our break room at work the other day. And we're watching Joel Osteen's Sunday sermon. I don't know if it was Joel Osteen and Kanye uh, together or not. Who cares? Neither one's saved. But you got 45,000 people that cram into that former basketball uh, arena. Now his church every weekend. And it reminds me of a beautiful mountain lake that's... A half mile wide, but only a half inch deep. There's no depth, no substance to any of it. And he starts his services off, you know, hold up your Bible and say it like, I mean, this is my Bible today. Oh, shut up. <laughs> you never hear him. You never see him crack it open. You never see him turn to the scripture to have people follow along. It's a, it's a prop. It's, a, it's an accessory they wear with their dress and their suit. So they look good on television holding it up. But third, not only do we have a forgiver and a healer, but we have a redeemer in Jesus Christ. Verse 4, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. What we call thrift stores used to be called redemption stores 40 years ago. You know, the truth is, you were worthless. You're someone with your temperament, your personality, your disposition, your talents, or lack thereof, are a dime a dozen. Seven and a half billion people in the world, there's bound to be a lot more people just like you and many more people better than you. But God saw something in you God. worth saving. You get the idea of a thrift store. Someone said, I don't need that anymore. They give away their used articles, their furniture, their clothing, just some thrift store, redemption store. And they clean it up, wash it perhaps. I hope they wash it, you know. And someone else comes along and says, listen, I need that. I can use that. And the price is something I can afford. They can still put it to good use. And God saw something in you worth saving. Something about you caused God the Father to send the Lord Jesus Christ to offer the most valuable payment for your soul, his blood, on the cross of Calvary. So that you could be brought back into fellowship with God once again. He paid the price for your redemption by shedding his own blood. Peter says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, by your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but, that is, you were redeemed, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. God offered the most valuable element in the universe, the blood of Christ, for the most important purchase he would ever make, that is your soul. You have to dwell upon that. You have to wrap your mind around that. Think that God cared enough about you and wanted to spend eternity with you enjoying fellowship with him. So much so that if you had been the only person who had ever sinned against the law of God, God would have sent Jesus Christ to suffer on your behalf, to die for your sake, to be judged for your sins. I'm so glad he was judged for my sins. He bore the punishment for my sins before I was ever born. So that when the day came, all I needed to do was admit my guilt to God and claim his righteousness and ask God to forgive me. And a great transaction took place between me and the Savior. Next, in Christ, we not only have a forgiver, a healer, and a redeemer, but we have a crowner. Verse 4 says, Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. The Bible says in Revelation 19, verse 8, that the fine linen garments of the believers one day, quote, are the righteousness of saints. And the only suitable 
crowns to be worn with a garment like that are crowns of loving kindness and tender mercies. Over your lifetime, you have to admit that God's kindness and his mercies have come to you along the way. They've been good to you, haven't they? Uh, his patience, his compassion, his grace, his long-suffering. I like that word. That word is self-descriptive, long-suffering. God puts up with a lot from you and me. He has to be very patient with us. And uh, I'm grateful that he's, that he's patient long. I don't want to be the cause of his suffering. Long-suffering. He, he He's tolerated so much from me over my lifetime as a disobedient, cowardly Christian so many times how he could still love me and give me an opportunity, another chance every morning I wake up to live for him, seek to do something for him that day that will bring honor to Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a marvelous thing to consider. Those loving kindnesses, those tender mercies will one day make up a crown on your head as a saint of God one day. Fifth, let me say this. In Christ, the believer has a forgiver, a healer, a redeemer, a crowner, and also a satisfier. Verse 5, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. We also read in Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The text says, uh, well, let me get ahead of myself here. In the New Testament, Paul tells the Christians, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 19. Not all your greed, but all your need. The religious approaches of the world can't satisfy the empty soul of a man. But the text says, He satisfieth thy mouth with good things. I don't need to elaborate on how wonderful it is to enjoy a good meal. Not everybody who's ever eaten well understands that. That should be self-explanatory. But... Um, Christ said good things can also come out of your mouth. Praise, thanksgiving to God, a new song. The Bible says he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Psalm 40, verse 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34, verse 1. That's what Thanksgiving Day should be all about for the child of God. The sum total of your education, your experiences, your business experience, your doctor's best advice and recommendations to you, some financial uh, consultant, none of those people and none of those things can bring real satisfaction to the empty soul that needs God. They cannot do it. Jesus said, you must be born again. Have you been born again? Amen. If you've been born again, say amen. Amen. Now, if you've been born again, shout amen. Amen. All right. Now, from now on, whenever you say amen, I want to hear it loud. That wasn't loud. <laughs> but in Christ, we also have a pitier. Verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. We read in Luke 15 verses 20 to 24, about the prodigal son. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. I put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. That's a great picture 
of any person who's been saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, such a prodigal son might have been stoned to death for being such a, a problem to his parents under the laws of Moses. However, uh, the Apostle John informs us, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1, verse 17. I'm sure glad God had grace and mercy and compassion upon me, that he's been uh, shown pity to me after my failures, my disappointments to him, my laziness, my cowardice as a Christian. You know, the punishment for your disobedience was, always, was already measured out uh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for the sin that you would one day commit. Long before you were ever born, Christ already died for you. And he shed just enough blood, more than enough blood, and had a more uh, a power and uh, efficacy uh, to cleanse whatever sin you might commit. And it's still powerful to cleanse whatever sin you may still commit. By Jesus Christ... You can escape the direct wrath of God by saying, God, I admit I'm a sinner and trust that it was poured out on Jesus Christ. So it doesn't have to be poured out on you. Amen. And the blessing of God's forgiveness and the, and the salvation of your soul uh, can then become yours. Your sin be put on Jesus Christ. And as I said a few minutes ago, a great transaction takes place between the sinner and the Savior. Lastly, in Jesus Christ, we not only have a forgiver and a healer, a redeemer and a crowner, not only a satisfier and a pitier, but he is a preparer of his throne. Verse 19 says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. About Jesus Christ, we read, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever, excuse me, for, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 9, verse 7. Psalm 72, verses 8 and 9 say, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. Boy, that would be a great scene. That would be a great scene. See, every enemy of Jesus Christ, every enemy of the Jew, every enemy of the Word of God, uh, every enemy who had ever uh, risen up against the church and the bride of Jesus Christ, uh, forced to get on the ground and lick the dust, uh, lick, his, lick the dust off his shoes, off his sandals. Revelation 19.15 and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Let's face it. Jesus Christ has never reigned and ruled the world that way. Not yet. But he's preparing his throne and getting ready to do so. And that throne is going to come and is going to set down uh, in the city of Jerusalem... And he's going to rule over planet Earth and the rest of the universe by extension. You say, how do I know that? Because Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Amen. Do you know if God, God, and I said this the other, I think last week in our Bible class, God commanded Adam to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But then Adam sinned. In the day ye eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam sinned, and eventually he and Eve died physically. If they had not sinned, it means they would still be alive today, right? And if they were still doing what they had been told to do, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, how crowded do you think this world would be right now? We'd all be, I mean, a thousand people per square foot fighting for every piece of land. That can only mean that his kingdom is going to go beyond planet Earth into the solar system, into the universe, and uh, be covered throughout all the galaxies in the person or in the people of his saints. I'm looking forward to that day. But he will establish a literal, visible, physical, messianic kingdom on the Earth and govern it the way it should have always been governed in absolute righteousness 
holiness, and sinlessness. It's hard to imagine a being like the Lord Jesus Christ, who is so impeccable and flawless, who never committed a sin, never said something that was false or pretentious. He never tried to put on airs and be something that he wasn't. He never tried to say something to impress someone and leave an impression with them that wasn't quite true. He never said something that he regretted, had to take it back and apologize for it. He never had a, committed a sin in thought, in word, in deed, in gesture, in glance, or look. How do you wrap your mind around someone that holy, that pure, that uh, unspotted, without blemish, no imperfections in him? When you compare yourself to him, you realize if it's not for God loving you enough to send Christ to die for you because he wanted to, you'd have no chance. You'd have no way of approaching God. And so God not only is all of those things we listed today, but he also offers uh, fellowship to the saints by and through the person of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that he did. I'm so glad that he offers it to you and to me and uh, says, whosoever will may come. I'm glad I came to him. I hope you've trusted him as your savior. Let's bring this to a conclusion and trust that God will use these things we've considered and, and bless those uh, who hear it in the future.